Uh, I want to welcome you. Uh, I am the moderator for the first panel, Kristen Ozinga, and our uh, fantastic speakers, Anne Lane Farrar, Bob Sachs, Jim Harlan, and Ted Sickleman. They'll be speaking in that order. Uh, I'm not going to talk for any longer than this because you have a, a bunch of really interesting things coming towards you, including patent privateers, uh, valuing patents, and uh, some stuff about standards. So it should be really, really interesting. Uh, and uh, I'm going to let them uh, talk. Thank you. I'm going to be sharing some uh, work in progress on a particular business model, patent privateering. So I imagine that most of the people in this audience are very familiar with the fact that non-practicing entities or NPEs come in lots of different shapes and sizes. The FTC recently had a full study on patent assertion entities or PAEs. There are patent defense funds, there's upstream innovators, universities, failed startups, operating companies um, that are, have gone bankrupt, all of whom still hold on to their patents. And then one of the newer categories is this last one, hybrid PAE or privateer. The name coming from the 16th, 17th century pirates, essentially, that were acting on behalf of a state but were not constrained by any of the state's rules or regulations. And so a hybrid PAE obtains the rights to enforce a patent, licensing or litigating it, but maintains a back office connection, a financial connection, with the party that assigns the patent to that uh, entity. So it's a non-practicing entity that then shares the revenues from the litigation or licensing. And hybrid PAE is the polite term, privateer is the pejorative one. So our research on this, it, it, my work is joint with uh, Jay Keeson and Dave Schwartz, and we were motivated by a lot of theoretical arguments in the literature along the lines of Adam's introduction here, that privateers or hybrid PAEs are harmful to the competitive environment, that they impose a tax on innovation, and in particular that they are being used to target operating companies' rivals as a means of raising rivals' costs. So that's a particular antitrust argument then. But all of these uh, uh, theories have testable implications. And of course, there's a, a theories on the other side as well, that perhaps these entities are simply profit maximizing, rational businesses that instead of acquiring low quality, weak patents to pressure um, settlements and extortion, uh, litigation extortion rents from operating companies, maybe are just trying to enforce higher quality uh, assets and earn a profit on them. So we, we sought to answer those questions with some empirical work. And in particular, we looked at what kind of patents do hybrid PAEs actually acquire? What do they look like? What technology classes are they in? What are their objective quality measures? What does their litigation behavior look like? We've done uh, quite a bit of data collection for this process. We started with litigation data sets because ultimately we're looking at what is the litigation behavior of a privateer or a hybrid PAE. But to that we added lots of other data. Patent demographics from the USPTO, so all of the front page information, the claims, the assignees, the prior art, uh, et cetera. And we took the USPTO's patent reassignment data. So how many times is this patent changing hands and to whom? We then matched all of the litigated patents with twins, patents coming from the same grant year cohorts in the same technology classes, but that were not litigated. So you can distinguish what's driving the litigation, what's not. Uh, lastly, we identified the hybrid PAEs using news reports and press releases. We recognize this isn't perfect, but this is a very opaque world to peek into, trying to identify who these parties are. And we feel that the results we've obtained so far actually uh, suggest that we've done a pretty decent job in identifying them because they do in fact look different than other non-practicing entities. Lastly, we're using technology classes that are grouped uh, into five big buckets. It's a modification of the Hall et al. Uh, NBER work um, from uh, back in 2001. And we're ignoring design, plant, and miscellaneous other patents. So we're focusing 
you know, on the patents that are used in manufacturing, in medical uh, uh, drugs and chemicals, um, in IT, uh, and, and in more of the areas of technology where you expect to see transactions in patents and litigation. So our first round of results is actually uh, forthcoming in the Journal of Empirical Legal Studies. And what I'm going to focus on today is just a brief summary of those findings and then our very preliminary work on expanding this analysis to more of a time series um, application. How do these things evolve over time, patents uh, being reassigned and litigated? So we found that the average number of reassignments per litigated patent is three. Uh, the categories with the highest percentage of reassignments to hybrid PAEs is not surprisingly IT, information technology, but also surgery and medical instruments um, at uh, nearly 3%. The rest of the technology categories were much smaller, more like 1 or 2% or 0. We also answered the first question of the theory that these patents are used as an extortion metric that they're taking low quality, low value patents and just pressuring settlements out of them by looking at objective quality metrics. So along the left hand column of this table, you'll see four different um, quality measures that economists rely on regularly and have in the empirical literature for decades. The number of forward sites, the number of claims per patent, and then two calculated indices, one called originality, one called generality. Those look at the breadth or span of technology in, in, for originality that the patent is pulling from. So where is its prior art coming from? And the theory is, if I'm pulling prior art from lots of different technology categories and combining them into something new, I'm more likely to be pioneering and original and therefore high quality. Likewise, on the back end, the generality is where are the technology classes of the patents that are citing me? If they're coming from a wide array of different technology classes, then again, the applications of this patented technology are pretty broad, and that means it's a general technology, higher quality, because it can be used in more places. So these are, these are four different objective quality metrics. And what we see is that in these four mutually exclusive categories across the rest of the table, that the privateer category scores quite highly on all of them. So for example, forward citations, the average patent in our sample data set uh, has 173 forward sites compared to the typical non-litigated patent, which is only 36. So many multiples higher. Um, similarly, for the number of claims, which is a metric for how broad the scope is of the patent, how much um, uh, the invention covers. And again, originality and generality, all higher than we see with non-litigation. So that's at least one mark then that this theory that the patents are being used um, to extort settlements or quick payments is not consistent with the data. Those last two columns on the right, those are like the positive control to show that. Yeah, so these are patents that are also litigated but not held by a privateer or any other kind of PAE. So yeah, these are the benchmarks and these are the patents that were never litigated and also not held by either of these categories. Because the numbers vary, that shows you you're measuring something. Okay. Exactly. We also looked at um, some regression analysis in terms of what is driving which patents end up in a hybrid PAE's hands. What factors seem to be the most associated with a privateer. And we found that being uh, the patent being reassigned more than once increases the odds. That, does, that makes a lot of economic sense. The more times a patent changes hands, that's an indication that it is a valuable patent. People are paying the renewal fees on it. It's worth transacting over. Um, patents with relative, relatively higher forward sites, that's consistent with the summary table that I just showed you. More claims, again. And then this last one, shorter independent claims. So the fewer the words in the, independent, in the shortest independent claim in the patent increases the association of being reassigned to a privateer. And this has to do with patent breadth. So the more words you add in the independent claims, the more conditions, the more limitations, the more uh, you're cabining what that claim is actually claiming. And so the shorter that is, um, 
the more likely that patent is to cover something broad. And so there's a trade-off going here because, of course, the broader the patent is, the more likely I'm able to establish infringement of that patent, the easier it's going to be to argue damages for it, but I'm also at a higher risk for invalidity. But clearly, the hybrid PAEs are, are choosing the breadth, the latter part, the, the infringement and the damages, over the risks um, involved in the invalidity. The other regression we ran was the odds of the patent being litigated. And here we see some of the same things uh, increasing those odds, but being held by a, by a privateer, being held by a uh, hybrid PAE, is highly statistically significant and positively associated with a patent being litigated. So at least that part of the theory, actually you can't, you can't distinguish between either theories because the law and econ argument that these are rational profit maximizing entities, you should see increased litigation. And also the antitrust theory, you should see increased litigation. You do, it's good to know that we, we can establish that, but you can't distinguish between the theories. We also determined that the timing of the litigation uh, comes later. So this is a survival function. Basically, the bottom line is that if, you're a pat if the patent is held by a hybrid PAE, the first litigation event it experiences is later, statistically significantly later, than patents that are not held by privateers. Now, the theory here could be that the privateers are holding on to the patents until damages are increased, they're waiting until the patents are old and, and the technology's done, but that, that, that industries are established around it. Or it could simply be that they don't get the patent reassigned to them until later. That's something we have to dig into in this next round of research, and we want to explain why these, these, uh, these timings are later for the hybrid PAEs. This one is surprising. The second line out to the right is the patents that are held by the hybrid PAE. And along the x-axis are the days in litigation. So basically, this result is saying that if the patent is held by a privateer and is litigated, that litigation lasts longer than for patent litigation for non-privateer held patents. That is a surprising result because it's certainly uh, counter to the antitrust theory that you're going in for the quick payment, that you're using um, these low quality patents to pressure a settlement. You would see these lines flipped. The fact that you see the litigation is lasting longer for the hybrid PAEs suggests that they're, they're taking it further into the adjudica adjudication process We've got to dig into this to see what are the percentages of settlements versus rulings, et cetera, but this is uh, suggestive that we're going to find something quite counter to what the antitrust theories have suggested. Lastly, uh, this is just to pique some curiosity, the left column is who the assignor of the patent is, who's giving the patent. And not surprisingly, we see three different groups are assigning them to the hybrid PAE. This middle column is the number of years from the date of grant of the patent to its reassignment to a hybrid PAE. So hybrid PAEs are obtaining patents from operating companies, from failed companies and failed startups, but also from patent holding companies. Now this group contains not only wholly owned subsidiaries of operating companies that have just spun off their patent operations but are still part and parcel of the operating company, but it also includes some other kinds of NPEs. So this is another category where we really want to dig in and figure out who exactly is giving the patents to the privateers and maintaining these back-end financial relationships. So we're in the very early stages of our time series analysis. This is a, just a, a brief truncated list of the things we have planned. One of the things I was hoping to gain from presenting to everyone today is to get ideas for things that everybody would like to see out of this research. I think it's a rich data set that combines litigation, reassignments, patent variables, and business models. And so we can answer a number of different questions, including are the privateers actually targeting rivals, direct rivals of the parties who are giving them the patents? That would be the raising rivals costs argument. Um, are they taking longer to litigate after uh, a patent is granted or reassigned to them 
or is it simply that the patent goes through a whole bunch of reassignments before it ends up in the privateer's hands and that's why their litigation is later? How likely are they to settle? Are they settling more often or not than other kinds of business models? And then lastly, we hope to add yet one more data set to our overarching data, which is uh, the renewal data from the USPTO, and look at are the privateer patents more likely to make it all the way through all the renewal payments, and what's the relationship between the timing of some of those benchmark renewal payments and when patents are reassigned or litigated. So I look forward to hearing your ideas over the uh, breaks. Please come find me and let me know what you want to see out of the data. Thank you. I'm going to talk a bit about uh, patent pools and how the more focus on specifically the, uh, the process in which patents are evaluated for essentiality. Um, a little bit of background, I've uh, been a patent evaluator since 2003, so I've spent the uh, past 15 years evaluating patents for various technology standards, uh, MPEG-4 audio, which is the audio you find in your uh, mobile devices, your DVD, your DVD Blu-ray player, so on and so forth, it's the common audio standard today, uh, 802.11, Wi-Fi, uh, LTE, which is on 4G uh, on your phone right now a number of other standards that you probably ha may have heard of in Europe, uh, DVB MHP, uh, which is an interactive television standard. So a number of different standards, probably done 3,000 plus evaluations over the past uh, 15 years. Um, so this is kind of where I come from. Uh, now when you hear about standard essential patents, uh, what you're typically hearing about is self-declarations, companies who own the patents and they say, you know, our patents are essential to a standard. And obviously, you know, if it's a self-declaration, there's a certain amount of bias there. You know, they want to say, we've got the patents, you need to come to us to license, and you end up in messy uh, bilateral negotiations, and it's typically the size of the pile uh, that uh, dictates you know, between the two parties which party has the most self-declared patents. Uh, sometimes they'll take some number of, of representative patents and map them to the standard trade claim charts, so on and so forth, and come to a price. Uh, what patents... So if you are an implementer in the field, then you need to go to all these parties uh, some, and you know, get your license. The, the operation of a patent pool uh, gives a different mechanism. You could say a one-stop shop uh, that reduces the cost of bilateral negotiations and obtaining the necessary license. So what are patent pools? So here's two kind of working definitions. The first is from Joel Klein uh, from the Department of Justice, which was used in what are, I'll get to a little bit in, in the patent in the business review letters, an aggregation of intellectual property rights that are subject to cross-licensing. And you can get this you know, quick medium of exchange, so to speak, uh, through a specific administration of a patent pool. Uh, Professor Merges is a slightly different defi definition, uh, giving kind of the typical characteristics of, of what a patent pool is there. I'm, I'm not going to go into the economics of patent pools and their justifications and their issues in antitrust. I leave that to people who actually know something about economics. I, I make no claim for that. Uh, in a quick potted history of, of patent pools, uh, they go back actually quite a ways. Uh, uh, Adam actually mentioned uh, the, the Singer sewing machines. There was the, the first sewing machine combination, which was a patent pool to, to break the lock uh, on lock stitch sewing machines uh, that was preventing them from being widely adopted right around the turn of the Industrial Revolution. And what was the most important thing to make was clothing. That was really one of the first things that was very heavily um, dependent on advanced technology then uh, to you know, reach a broad consumer market when previously clothes had been more or less handmade. Uh, in, in the early part of the 20th century, uh, 1917, there was the Aircraft Manufacturers Association, which is a patent pool forced uh, by the government on the airline aircraft industry uh, between the Wright brothers and Curtis uh, Manufacturing. Uh, they were in a patent stalemate uh, and preventing the development of airplanes to the point that the U.S. government was actually buying planes made in France because planes made it because the air, U.S. aircraft were so far behind. So that was a government-enforced uh, uh, patent pool. Uh, and then there was many other patent pools uh, through the, the mid the early the 20th century. Everything from Phillips screws to fuses and paints and wrinkle finishes and even furniture slip covers. So they're not a new phenomenon. They've been around for quite a while. Uh, in the modern era. Uh, beginning in the 1990s, uh, the DOJ started issuing what they called business review letters, 
uh, to, to look at the antitrust characteristics of patent pools. And there's a number of you know, well-known letters for different pools. The MPEG-2 pool, MPEG pool started by uh, MPEG-LA, uh, the 3C, uh, three-company DVD forum, and the 6C, six-company DVD pools, uh, the 3G pool, uh, the RFID consortium. Uh, those were all approved. That's why they were in green. And then IPXI, uh, which was disapproved. Uh, and they kind of, these letters kind of go through a, there's, a business, there's a request letter that lays out the nature of the pool and how it will behave and how it will operate, um, the administrative aspects, the aspects in terms of, of, of whether the licensing conditions, and particularly how patents get into the pool, uh, and we'll get to that. And you can find these letters uh, at, the, at the URL here. So some current pools that are out there. Uh, MPEG LA is, is though the most well known is probably is really the originator of this field. They have pools for uh, advanced video coding H.264, which is the video standard that is used commonly now. DisplayPort, which is the the, the modern standard for um, has that kind of funny shaped connector you connect your displays with. FireWire, which was uh, a previous uh, Internet standard. They also have uh, biotechnology pools, Librase and uh, a CRISPR related pool. Uh, via licensing, who I've been the evaluator for for since like 2003, uh, MPEG-4 Audio, MPEG Surround, uh, LTE, WCDMA, and, and 802.11, Agora C, which is a standard in Europe, for example, that has to do with um, real-time road information. Uh, SysVal over in Italy also has uh, the early MPEG audio pools, and VoiceAge is another example. They do codecs for telecommunications, so what, what's being used in, in your phone. And this is just a sample. There are many others out there. I just wanted to give you kind of a current highlight. So quickly, what are the characteristics of a modern patent pool? There will be a set of a specific technology standards, either one, one standard, for example, uh, in MPEG audio, it's the, it's, it's the MPEG audio standard. In LTE, it's an entire collection of, hun of any, it's about 100 different documents. Uh, the MPEG standard is about 1,400 pages. The, the LTE standards probably are 30,000 pages in all that comprise the body of technology that describes what happens in your cell phone and in the network. Uh, the license requirements are the you know, reasonable non-discriminatory. Uh, an independent expert evaluator uh, is to determine the essential patents. This is the objective function. Uh, there's requirements as to how the patent holders can license outside the pool. They can't be limited to licensing within the pool. Uh, there's always a patent administrator which will handle the day-to-day -day mechanics of, of receiving the royalties and uh, distribution. And then there's certainly no competitive sharing of competitive information. Um, so what is essentiality? Uh, this is the, the key thing, right? A patent, for the patent pool to operate, it's only those patents that are quote unquote essential to the pool. And uh, these are, this is from the MPEG-2 business, re business review letter, and it talks about the nature, and for econo you know, economists know this, the substitutes and complements. That the, that the assumption is that the patents in a pool are complementary. They are not substitutes for each other, they go together. They can be used together, but they are not competing technologies and that the, the continuing role of the independent evaluator, my job, is to be the guarantor that portfolio patents are complements, not substitutes. Now, that's great in economic theory. In practice, not so much. Um, so this is kind of a, you want to have it in pretty pictures. Uh, I'm the evaluator, and uh, for the licensors, you know, I say, yep, that's, uh, those patents are in the pool. And for the, the uh, patent DC, you know, you're not getting in. I'm, I'm protecting the, the integrity pool. You, I don't make a determination as to whether a substitute or complement. I look at the, the context, the content of the patent, and analyze it with respect to the standard. So what is essentiality? There are a number of different definitions that kind of fall into two major classes. Technically essential, uh, that is, it's necessary in order to comply with the standard. In other words, I use the notion of a compliant device. If you were to manufacture a compliant cell phone, or if there was a standard for these things, if you were going to manufacture a compliant cell phone, would you have to perform the functions and have the structures uh, that are claimed here in order to do that? And if you had those, would they infringe, you know, by having the standard, would you infringe the patent? Uh, there's also necessary kind of an economic necessity, necessary as a practical matter. So not merely those that are technically necessary, but those which a, a, tip, a typical licensee is likely to require. Uh, there's no realistic alternative. This is this notion of there are no substitutes, uh, no economically viable substitute. So there's multiple different definitions that the, the DOJ has blessed. Uh, I tend to, the pools that I work focus on technical essentiality, that compliance with the standard would necessarily infringe the device, uh, infringe the patent. So what are some issues that we have in, in uh, patent evaluations? 
Uh, one of the questions that come up is validity. That is not an issue. Uh, the patents are presumed under the DOJ guidelines. Patents are presumed valid. So when I get a submission, uh, and any evaluator gets submissions, there is no evaluation of prior art. There's no evaluation of indefiniteness. The patents are presumed to be valid. The only question is one essentially of infringement. Uh, what is the standard of review? Uh, unlike in the, the bilateral context uh, where you're making an aggressive assertion, um, you're making every possible argument to uh, establish that a patent is, uh, covers the, language, the, the technology and the standard. Um, in my process, I'm not trying to um, defeat all possible arguments. The question is of essentiality is one of does the submitter prevent, provide a reasonable argument, a reasonable basis. So they provide a technology analysis, a claim chart generally. Uh, we'll look at the claim chart. Uh, do the claim construction, is their claim construction reasonable? I, uh, and then we look at the technology and say is the mapping reasonable? So again, it's an evaluation. It's not meant to be a full-blown, uh, say, defense of finding any possible weakness in the claim. We, we try to come up with an objective analysis of what is, is the re representation by the, the submitter objectively reasonable, uh, and that we can come to a basis that, that given that objectively reasonable conclusion, um, does, it, does the patent, does the performance of the compliant device, whether it's a method claim or an apparatus claim, would compliance then infringe the claims? So the review process is typically it's a submission. You know, the submission comes in, it'll have a claim chart. Sometimes there's uh, additional collateral <coughs> information. We'll take a look at the claim chart. We certainly review the patent, look at the full prosecution history, uh, do the claim construction if necessary, uh, look at and obviously review the standard. Uh, sometimes there are multiple rounds of discussions with the patent submitter. Um, in some cases, we'll actually go back to the underlying working documents from the working groups uh, that develop the standard uh, to see, for example, if this submitter actually submitted the underlying technology to the working group to get it approved. Uh, often you find the patents fall into two major categories. There are the patents which were invented by the company, the technology that is in the standard was invented by the company that is submitting the patent, and it's more or less a, a clear, it's clearly the same technology. What's in the standard is really what's in the patent, and it's really a question of, okay, did they get the claims right? Then you have patents which often uh, are from another technology area or a similar technology area, predate the standard by some number of years. And now there's, it's a real bifurcation, right? I've got claims that are on some wireless technology, has nothing to do, was not written to re to, as part of, say, 802.11 or on LTE, a completely different and independent technology base. And then there's this question of this mapping. So is the claim construction reasonable to map it from the language of the claim? which is often very different from what the language in the standard is. And then there's the technology mapping is given that construction, does it really map to what's in the standard? So two general cases of analysis that come into play. Um, one of the interesting things is that there are sometimes issues where it's clearly the technology invented by the company that went into the standard, and yet the claims don't really get it right. There was a failure somewhere along the way. You could say either the patent attorney got it wrong or somewhere along the line, what actually got adopted in the standard is different from what was really in the patent. And there can be minor variations uh, there. I've even seen cases where, um, particularly in foreign uh, counterparts, say Japanese patents, where there have been translation errors and nobody caught it except the evaluator. I had this one case where the, the claim, the standard uh, required a, there was a power function, something squared and what got translated was root. So it was taking the square root as opposed to taking the power. Uh, mm -hmm. And nobody caught it through several years in the, we, of uh, the patent being out in the field until it got to the patent evaluators and we carefully, you know, we, we go down to that level of detail. So you sometimes find those type of things. Um, so that's the kind of the overview of the review process. Uh, what, is, what is it we're looking at? There are what called the normative and informative portions of the standard. Um, the normative is what defines this is the required technology. The informative is um, the informative is that this is the descriptive. This is kind of what it's about. And different standards are written in different ways. Some are very very technical and provide no explanation of what is going on. You have you either know it or you don't. Other standards are written to provide this is kind of what this is really about and give an explanation of what's going on. Um, so let me give you an example here from the MPEG-4 audio standard. And this is, a, this is, a, this is illustrative because this is a decode standard. Um, and that means 
the, to get audio in your device, to get a, a music file, it has to be encoded. And so this is the, this is the encoder. Not working. So this is the encoder over here. So you get some, so audio will come in and it goes through all of these complex calculations. And these are different tools that can be used. And what, this is interesting because what you get then, um, and I'll get to this point in a second, so you encode the file, you get a coded audio file. That's all informative. Any description about the encoder is informative. You get this coded audio file, and then you go to the decoder, and then you decode it with these tools. Now, what I said earlier about substitutes and complements, at the very bottom here, and the very top there, these are three different ways of encoding the file. These are substitutes for each other. They are clearly substitutes for each other, yet they're all in the standard. Then you go to these different tools, and then they are, uh, uh, in some sense, tend to be uh, uh, um, complements together, but that's really not true because they could be used as substitutes in a way. This is the LTE spectrum. This is the LTE standard. I've sh shown kind of, this is your claims will cover either a user equipment or a base station. Other parts we uh, will be subject to different types of patents. So you can see there's a lot of complexity involved. Um, let me just quickly talk about this notion of substitutes and complements. Um, in the standards, what happens is there are issues about is an optional feature. What is if something in your phone, for example, you don't use it all the time, you use it sometimes. Your phone has to be able to respond to it. Is that really essential? Do you have to have that in your phone to comply with the standard? And the general answer is yes. If, if a device must respond to a signal or a command that's being sent to it, either in a file or over the network, then even though it's not used all the time, if it has to respond in a very particularly described way, a patent that covers that functionality is, is deemed to be essential. And so you can see here what we have in, in the MPEG standard is you have all these different combinations of tools. These, when they're put together in particular combinations, are called objects. And when you have different combinations of objects, you get profiles. And what gets licensed are these different objects and profiles. And that's how you handle the issue of, of what would otherwise be optional features in the standard. But as I said before, this notion that standards don't include uh, substitutes is not really true in the real world. And then just quickly, what is it that I do? This is an example. Uh, this is from the MPEG audio standard. The, the red arrows are actually for my, my use, not yours. Uh, this is how I track variables in these equations. And I have to figure out on a given, in a given thing, for example, that language like this, deriving gain, great gain factors for a plurality of frequency bands, so on and so forth, um, that actually maps on this particular set of equations and how those, the Gs are the gain factors and there's lots of other stuff going on here. But this is kind of the process that we go through. Uh, if this makes your, your, your eyes roll backwards and, 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 and you want to tune out, this is what I do every single day. Um, <laughs> so. That is, in a nutshell, the evaluation, the nature of patent evaluations and the evaluation process. Thank you. All right. Um, so uh, thank you all for having me. Thank you, uh, CPIP, for the invitation and to be a member of this, this great panel. Um, whenever I'm around Anne, I just feel a little dumber just because I think she's, she's brilliant. But, um, and Bob had some really interesting points. So I'm gonna be here to talk about some, some of the other stuff about standards that, that, that Professor Kristen mentioned earlier. Um, and just to give you a little bit of a background, my name's Jim Harlan. I'm the Senior Director of Standards and Competition Policy at InterDigital. Uh, as you may have seen on one of Ann's slides, she has this identified as an R&D organization. So many moons ago, I used to work at BlackBerry, and one of the first departments that got cut in the unfortunate um, downsizing of BlackBerry was our advanced technology research labs. Um, well, that's what, our, that's, what, that's what we do at InterDigital. We're all about advanced technology. Um, we don't have a product per se. We have know-how. We have... Um, engineers, and we, we enter into JVs. Um, so a little bit more about InterDigital. We're about a 500 employee company, about a almost 3 billion market cap, about 500 million a year in revenue. 
global footprint. Um, we have about 35,000 uh, patents uh, issued and pendings worldwide. Um, about 90% of them are homegrown, and uh, the other 10% are through part of, part of our partnership deals and acquisitions. Um, so we've been around about 40 years. We've been public for more than 20, uh, and we, we hope we're not going away. Um, so a disclaimer, traditional disclaimer, these views are my own and don't represent those of my company. And one of my favorite cartoon artists in the engineering field is uh, Mr. Dilbert here. And uh, so how did the industry standards <coughs> meeting go? Did you convince 83 companies to adopt standards that benefit only us while doing the entire industry in the long run? Or are you a com com complete failure? And then, can I hear those choices again? So it, I bring this up because it's sort of highlights come out of some of the, um, uh, I guess some of the thoughts that, that, or it pokes fun at some of the thoughts out there on standards organizations. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So a lot of times what I'm asked to do when I speak at conferences is I actually go to these meetings. So I, I'm sort of boots on the ground. I'm I there. I've traveled 75% of the time. Wife and kids hate it, but it's I love my job. Um, travel all over the world, which is part of the standards um, process. And, and so that's what I'm going to try to do today is to give you a little bit of a peek into kind of some of the realities that go on. I'm going to hope to keep it within 15, 20 minutes because I can ramble. So just a really, really high level, 30, maybe even a 60,000 foot view. This is kind of the, this is an old, old image. It's been around for a long time, but it gives you an idea of where standards are in the world. So standards, especially the world I come from is cellular standards. It's, an, it's considered an enabling technology. So everything on your phone is essentially enabled by cellular. Like I think the top 10 to 15 apps in the app store, you need to have a network connection to use them. If I'm going to take a train from DC to Delaware, it'd be great to download and watch a movie. Well, I need cellular or wireless connection somehow to do that. So it's an enabling technology. And then so in the greater scheme of things, you have like things like the World Trade Organization. You have a global marketplace. You have tari tariffs to trade barriers, which we're kind of seeing with the current administration right now. Um, and then you uh, have certification and conformity assessments. So that's sort of like in the penumbra of the standards world. Then you have what are called the big three I's. That's uh, ITU, ISO, and IEC. That's what I've identified as the global standards bodies. Um, they're all related, but a little different. ITU is the International Telecommunication Union, and their headquarters in uh, Geneva. And that's, course, that's sort of the, the, the pool that I swim in. Uh, when uh, Bob mentioned um, MPEG, MPEG LA, those things like that, a lot of those are standardized, not just in ITU, but also ISO. Um, and the JCT1 is like the Joint Technical Committee 1. They thought there were going to be like two, three, and four. There's not. There's just one. So <laughs> you should drop the one, but they haven't. It's been, you know, a decade, I think. Uh, and then just generally, you have regional bodies, national bodies. And then ANSI is pointed out here because America is a little different than everybody else. Is we have the American National Standards Institute which has an MOU with the Department of Commerce. And that MOU says, I think it dates back to 2007, 20, 2007 it was renewed. I think 2000, it was initially signed. But it essentially says from the Department of Commerce to ANSI that, that you will be our representative kind of going forward out in the standards world. You'll represent American policy, American government interests, and we really rely on you to do that. So what ANSI does is they are an, accred an accrediting standards body. So they don't develop standards, they accredit other American standards bodies. So IEEE is an ANSI standards developer, an ASD. They're, they're an ANSI accredited standards developer. Uh, ADIS, or ADIS, depends how you want to pronounce it. TIA, there's, there's hundreds of them. Um, so, so that's what ANSI does. It accredits these different standards bodies. And a distinction that I make, because I just, like I said, I swim in this pool, um, SSOs you'll hear a lot, or SDOs you hear a lot, and a lot of times you hear them interchanged. I think they're different. A standards development organization is actual a group, a, a body out there. You have these engineers that are in there, and they're, 
They're working hard at creating some standard that's new. That's a development organization. And you have standard setting organizations who are sort of like, you know, let's pick this American plug to be our standard, or let's pick the European plug to be our standard. They sort of like pick things that are available and they set that as a standard kind of going forward. So I make the distinction, but I know most of the general population does not. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm highlighting ITU here and 3GPP for a reason. Because, I, I, like I said, I swim in the cellular space. Um, and 5G is, is the topic du jour. So 5G is the current vernacular for what's known as IMT 2020. IMT is International Mobile Telecommunications. And this is all set up by the ITU, which remember is an international organization. They have a bunch of smart engineers. They figure in 2010, okay, what do we want 2020 next generation of cellular uh, tech to look like? So they come up, they did that in 2000 for, for, the, for uh, IMT Advanced, and they did that earlier for IMT 2000. So IMT 2000 is 3G, uh, or is I think 4G, IMT Advanced is LTE, and IMT 2020 is um, 5G. And this is part of their vision. And I had a discussion earlier, earlier this week, because a lot of people get confused on 5G. It sounds like fifth generation, or five gig, or they don't really know what's going on. And then what's IoT? Is that involved in it? So this is my understanding of it. Um, so on the left, you have uh, the ITU IMT 2020's technical vision of what uh, it's going to look like in 10 years by 2020 when it gets deployed. And the image I downloaded was not very good when I realized it, when it printed out. But essentially, you're gonna have like peak data rates are at a gig. You know, currently, I think they're allowed at 100 meg or maybe even 10 meg. And this is on your cell phone. This is on radio communication. Um, you're gonna have greater mobility. Your latency is gonna go down. Uh, you'll have better spectrum efficiency network efficiency, connection density. You hear about these small cell, cell dense networks. You know, you're no longer gonna have the 200 foot radio antennas. You're gonna have a small cell dense network for 5G. So it's a technical requirement. Now these are the use cases. There's three essential use cases. Enhanced mobile broadband, massive machine type communications, and ultra, ultra reliable low latency communications. This, this sort of like is kinda you know, your IoT is sort of like in there a little bit, and it's kind of over here a little bit, sort of on the bottom part of the spectrum. So at the top you have enhanced mobile broadband. So we'll download our movies faster, or we'll Snapchat our friends even quicker, and things like that. That's not gonna change a whole lot of our personal lives. It's the other stuff. It's the smart home building, smart cities. I mean, it's, it's gonna be unreal, but it's all gonna be enabled by the same tech. So the tech is ubiquitous. It's the applications that are kind of different and unique, and the vision is really with the applications. So you'll notice, like, self-driving cars, you want that, you want it to be ultra-reliable, ultra and it's low latency because you only need, like, a like, certain number of bits set on information if you have autonomous vehicles. Um, but you're going to want to know if there's a car wreck ahead to have everybody stop. You don't want any latency so that some, like, you know, some, some car is sort of waiting. Five minutes, are you kidding? All right, let me go on. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? it wants me to go faster apparently. Um, so, okay, 3GPP is a third generation partnership program. And uh, they, since they sort of came together, a bunch of SDOs came together and created it about, uh, I think in 2009, or 1998. Um, then, uh, then it just made logical sense to have them continue with the technical development. So they did 4G and now they're also working on 5G and this is just a timeline. 3GPP, I really don't have enough time to go through all this. Um, it's, a, it's a partnership program uh, that comprises these, they call them the seven organizational partners and they're the people in the middle, Areeb, CCSA, ADIS, TTC, Etsy, TSDSI, and TTA. So you can see those are SDOs, the global footprint. And what 3GPP does is they create technical specifications. And those SDOs um, transpose those specifications into standards. And that's, the, so technical specs different from standards, 
government bodies get involved, regulatory issues. Um, in the U.S., we don't we don't have to uh, we don't have the standards built into our regs, whereas in India they do. Like India through TSDSI, they've got to transpose every. So transpose means to copy essentially from one technical standard to uh, technical spec of the standard. Getting into the weeds here. Um, but this is an example of what I wanted to show you, what a traditional technical meeting looks like. You know, imagine this room probably twice as long and twice as wide with maybe four times the number of people. And they meet about, and this is just one technical meeting and all of the different standards bodies that are in just 3GPP. And they all have prepared for months for this one meeting. And then decisions are made and, and um, the process continues. Um, but what I wanted to kind of highlight is, is this page is that so in any technical meeting you'll have hundreds of companies that, that submit thousands of contributions just at that one meeting there are 2200 contributions submitted or documents and, and each of those documents could have one to ten or more proposals so you could ostensibly have ten thousand ideas coming to the table and all these smart engine, PhD engineers are all working together to figure out what's the best way to get this to work, um, to meet that IMT 2020 goal that we saw a few slides ago. And the way I often describe it is, and I don't have it on this slide, I'll have it later, is you think of, you know, and I think it's, it's Ann, and correct me if I'm wrong, who said that it's not like a matter of pulling a technology off the shelf or, you know, out of, out of a grocery store like a box of cereal. Um, you're not doing that. When, so what you have, you have a bunch of PhD cooks in there. They're trying to bake a cake, and they all have their own ideas on how to bake it, and they have thousands of ingredients, and they come together, and then, and then about and then next quarter, they don't like what they did last time, or they, maybe they need to move it around a little bit, and then they come together again. And so it's this iterative development process that until hopefully 10 years later, you have something that meets the vision that ITU had. And I probably have less than a minute, but... <laughs> uh, here are IPR policies, which is an important issue regarding the whole standards world. IPR submissions have two components, licensing declarations and IPR disclosures. Um, so this is the ITUs. In your, in your licensing declaration, it's kind of right here is the highlighted. It's the patent holder is prepared to grant a license on reasonable, <coughs> excuse me, reasonable terms and conditions. My voice is really going here. Um, and, and Etsy's is very similar. They're prepared to grant licenses on Fran terms and conditions. So the reason why I highlight that is because a lot of times that stuff gets lost in the press or gets lost on people. It's, it's not like, there's a couple things here. It, it's not, IPR submissions are, are voluntary, first of all, right? So if, if, I'm at a, if I'm a patent holder and I choose to, um, to not submit an IPR declaration, nine times, or even 99% of the time, the SDO just sort of hums and haws and they get mad, but development continues. Yeah, thanks a minute. <laughs> um, and... Uh, I don't know of any SDO that really works at pulling out technology, except for one. I know uh, W3C, if you don't provide uh, an RF declaration or declaration at all, they will go through and fine tune and look at your claims and they will pull out the tech from the, from the standard. Um, and, uh, all right, and so I'm just trying, trying to make sure I hit all the parts. So Bob mentioned something about essentiality. In the, at Etsy, where I hang out most of the time, there's a distinction between what's mandatory and what's optional. And I think you sort of touched on that a little bit. Because just because, you know, and if we look back at that language, it's, if I brought it up there. So right there, like kind of the, one of the, the second line. If I have IPRs that are or become and remain essential, so I can have a good faith belief and I'll submit an IPR declaration that I may or may have something that's essential, meaning something that's mandatory or optional, on day one, there, I, I might not, it might not actually become that at the end of the day once the standard is finalized because, like I said, all those 
smart engineer chefs might completely shift it from a cake to a scone or something out like that. And, and I thought they were going to have a cake. So it could be completely different, That's, which is why a lot of times claims might not match up to the actual um, uh, published standard. And so, um, so that's one of the things I think is kind of important to know is that, is, is that just because you say something is essential, it doesn't mean it's essential without these really great opportunities to have like a third party or a court or an arbiter to sort of really read, okay, this really is, um, lines up, meshes with the standard to a mandatory section. Um, just want to make sure I kind of hit some of the stuff. Oh, and in case you fell asleep, <laughs> you may have, I don't know, I didn't. But um, so this open, transparent, and consensus space, that's key. And in one of my earlier slides, like at Etsy, everything's open, transparent, consensus space. If you're a member of Etsy, you can join any of the committees and all this stuff, even the governing committees. Um, one of the downsides is when you have other SDOs where it's like they, they bifurcate the concepts. They say, okay, well, Development is open consensus and um, transparent, but uh, governance isn't. Otherwise, we'd get nothing done. Well, that's not true, because if you worked on a consensus basis, you'd get stuff done. But, you know, um, and development is not picking the technology. I love my chef uh, analogy. There's thousands of ingredients. It's a development process. It's not picking winners or losers. It's, 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 like, it's like what Bob was showing with those crazy math formulas. I mean. I left math back, you know, 20 plus years ago. So it's, uh, well, not really, but um, it, it is these guys, they're, they're scientists, they're engineers, they love this, they live for it. And uh, Fran, this is important, and I know my time's up, but what I, what I highlighted with the bold underlines is it's terms and conditions. Just because you say something is Fran doesn't like ding, ding, ding mean it's rates. Rates is, you know, if you and I are doing business deals, the, the dollar amount might be subsequent to what our actual deal is. We might be interested in a JV. We might be interested in swapping technology. We might be some other, doing some other things. As long at the, as at the end of the day, things are fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory. And, um, and you certainly can't accomplish that. At least five plus years ago, a lot of things were zero dollar cross licenses. Does that mean the rate was zero dollars? No, it does not mean that at all. It means that they made business deals and, and they did other things to, to satisfy that fray in terms and conditions. It never says rates anywhere. Um, so I'm over. That's it. That's all I got. <laughs> all right. So I'm Professor Ted Sickleman from the University of San Diego School of Law, where I teach patent law and a number of other IP courses. I'll try to get you back a few minutes for, uh, for Q&A here. So in 2012, I signed a letter with a number of other academics urging the ITC not to grant injunctions in the situation of standard essential patents. Because I thought at the time, if the holder of the standard essential patent agreed to FRAN terms, then they were saying, hey, a reasonable and non-discriminatory license is sufficient for us, meaning money damages, to collect what we need to incentivize our R&D and commercialization efforts. So barring, for example, bad faith on the part of the implementer and licensing, there shouldn't be an injunction in the ITC. So this is essentially, uh, this view, the baseline uh, assumption of the standard view of friend obligations, and it ties into a broader theory that you find in the economics of contracts and that's when private parties contract with each other, they are engaging in what achieves a socially efficient or an optimal result. But there are certain tops, types of contracts where this isn't true. So let's take a step back before we look at that and just think about what the major debate is today in terms of friend. It's really two things. One is what should the friend terms be in a monetary sense? And two, are the parties bargaining in good faith? I'm going to step out of this debate and show that there are potential problems with FRAND even if the parties bargain in good faith and even if we uh, adopt a fairly wide view of what FRAND could be. Why is this? So this is because of the standard setting process itself. So even absent a holdout, 
as it's called. This is where uh, the implementer doesn't bargain in good faith. Uh, I'm going to show you there may be problems with respect to Fran. Now, what's the standard story? The standard story is once a patent is declared as a standard, then the implementer essentially has a gun to its head if there's an injunction for infringing a patent by adopting or implementing the standard. Why? Because if I implement the standard, which I have to, as Bob tells us, there are a few situations where you have a choice, but in most situations, there's no choice, and even when you do have a choice, there may be a very small number of choices you can take as an implementer. If I want to sell in this market with a standard, for example, I want to make a mobile phone and sell it, then I have to practice it, and I have to practice the standard essential patent. And if I don't, I'll go into an infringement suit, and if there's an injunction, I'll have to pay a lot of money. Or if there are lost profits, I'll have to pay a lot of money, or even as I'll show you in a minute, I have to pay a reasonable royalty under the non-Fran view of reasonable royalty. I'll have to pay a lot of money. So Fran is said on the standard view to solve the so-called hold up problem that standard essential patent owners can present to implementers by holding this gun to their head. At the same time, there have been a number of papers showing, well, there may be a hold out problem. Why? Because once the standard essential patent owner has sunk its costs in R&D, the implementers, if they can somehow collude, whether explicitly or implicitly, and hold out in order to reduce the rates effectively paid to the patent owner, then we reduce the value of the patents too much in terms of optimal incentives. This is the standard story. I'm going to ask a question that goes before this story, before the patents granted, and looks at the standard selection process itself and argues that you may have um, so-called monopsony power problems, meaning problems of the buyers, uh, of the implementers, effectively acting like a cartel, effectively driving down prices, even absent holdout, so in the standard setting process itself. So I do this through three hypotheticals. So first, suppose there's one innovator and many implementers. If there's one innovator or a standard that's so incredible, everyone's going to adopt it. You don't need a standard setting organization. What happens? All the implementers adopt it and pay whatever the rate would be relative to the non friend rate that would be awarded in suit if they infringed. Now suppose there are a few innovators or multiple innovators and just one implementer. This is the monopsonist problem. So the first one's the monopolist, where you have one innovator. And here we have one potential buyer. They're called a monopsonist. Here again, we don't care if there's a standard setting organization. Why? The monopsonist, the one implementer, is going to negotiate with each of the potential innovators and determine weighing the benefits and costs of what? The benefits will be of a better technology standard, but those in general will cost more. Right? And then the benefits on the other side will be of a lower cost, but the cost will be lower quality. Now here's the big problem when you have one implementer. What's efficient for the implementer in the short term may be a lower quality standard that costs less, but that's not going to be efficient or best for society in the long run, particularly with setting up incentives for high quality innovation in the long run. So we're going to see that standard setting organizations themselves look a lot like the monopsonist situation with one buyer when we look at how standards are selected. And we've heard a lot about just recently how they're selected, which ties in well to what I'm about to tell you. So now consider the real world, which is hypothetical number three, or close to the real world. You have a handful of innovators and a large number of implementers. And we're going to take a standard where the value is very high from network effects. So there's a huge incentive to adopt standards. If we have many implementers, it may seem like, and they're all sitting in a room baking a cake, that there's no problem in terms of efficiency because we're going to have a competitive market essentially deciding what standard's going to be adopted. But that's not the case for two reasons. One, we're not going to adopt a standard that's not presented at a standard setting organization meeting. They're not all going to sit in there and say, hey, you know what? Even though there's uh, 10 standards, 10 technologies being presented for each idea here and thousands of things we're discussing, what we really need to do is choose something 
from somebody, some company that's not a member of the SSO. It's not gonna happen because the costs of doing that are extremely high. Second, the business people of the members of the implementers know that those standards are gonna be subject to FRAND. And although it's not a rate, in effect it is, because courts have held that FRAND rates essentially are lower than what you're going to get in an ordinary patent case for non-FRAND committed patents. Because that rate's lower, there's going to be strong pressure from the members, the business people of the members, on the engineers to adopt the standard of a member. So this means we're essentially excluding out non-member technology. But what happens? If I'm an innovator, I'm forced to join the SSO for my technology to be adopted as a standard, and I'm forced to commit to FRAN because I basically have no choice unless I have the next best thing, right, um, since sliced bread, uh, to join the SSO. Well, what happens in that situation? It looks just like the monopsonist who's trading off what? Quality for price. So the price goes down with FRAND, and at the same time, the quality goes down because knowing that I'm going to be committed to FRAND if I'm an innovator, I'm going to produce a lower quality innovation. I call this hold down. It's not hold out because it doesn't occur after the fact. The price of the innovator's technology is held down by the SSO process itself. So in the absence of offsetting benefits, for example, um, from reducing so-called hold-up problems, which we know from recent literature uh, doesn't seem to be as much of a problem as the standard story thinks, what we get ultimately is potentially dynamic inefficiency. Dynamic inefficiency says we're setting up prices that aren't going to provide the right signals to innovators to produce high quality innovations. Now, how does this tie back to contract theory? There are a class of contracts where although the parties privately experience gains, we consider them to be against public policy. So think about, for example, a contract uh, for a hitman to engage in right, a murder. That may increase the private efficiency of the parties. One person gets paid and the other one's happy, but it's not socially efficient. We as a society think that's a bad thing, of course. So that means it's privately efficient, but socially inefficient, closer to home. Contracts for non-competes that are considered unreasonable. So restraints on employees taking new jobs. Every single state, whether you're California or not, considers unreasonable non-competition restrictions to be unenforceable, even though the two parties may have been very sophisticated and agreed to them. What else? Horizontal agreements to restrict prices. In fact, that's what this is like. Under the antitrust laws, they're often considered to be unenforceable. So my argument here is that even though the private parties are agreeing to friend obligations, it may not be in the interest of society because of reduced incentives to innovate, and as such, courts need to take a serious look at these agreements in each specific case, weighing the costs and benefits of FRAND, and perhaps considering going back to standard patent remedies like injunctions, standard uh, lost profits, and reasonable royalties to keep incentives high for innovation. And with that, I got you four minutes back. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ted. <laughs> So we do have a little bit of time for questions and answers, and I'm sure the panel would be happy to take them. There are microphones on either side of the, and Kevin and Rochelle, I guess, are helping me out with that. So if you have a question, let them know. Justin up front has a question, Kevin. Okay, um, this is a question, I guess, in combination for what Ted was talking about and uh, Mr. Harlan was talking about. Uh, so Ted, um, your scenario, doesn't it depend on when the innovator joins the SSO, the innovator has to assume that all its technology is on the table? And, and let me fill out that question, because if I'm listening to Mr. Harlan and I'm listening to the story of the thousand chefs, and I'm listening to you saying that it's not just the technology people, but it's the business people who are at the meeting. I'm imagining what happens is that the business people, the technology people say, isn't it amazing? We've got, we're on the cusp of getting the SSO to adopt this and this and this. And the business people say, no, that's not so amazing. In fact, why don't you get them to not do that? 
Um, that is, couldn't, isn't your idea dependent upon the innovator thinking all of its technology is on the table when it joins the, the cartel of the SSO? And isn't it in the power of the business people working with their technology people to actually shape the discussion to take some of their technology off it? So, so I would say what, what you've just characterized is more akin to what's um, under the rubric of the holdout problem. So suppose um, you are a member and uh, you have implementers who think you're going to charge too much, so they basically decide or collude not to use your technology relative to another member's. So what's interesting about um, my premise, hold down, is that it doesn't depend upon anything the business people tell specifically uh, to the engineers with respect to any specific member. It just says choose a technology of a member. That's it. Because they're going to be encumbered by FRAND, and we're going to have to pay less in the long run, which, like the monopsonist single buyer, is in our short-term interest. So as long as um, you join the SSO, and as long as you put your technology on the table, you're going to be subject to that. Now, yes, if you have an invention that's so incredible that everyone's going to choose it, regardless of whether you're in the SSO or not, then this wouldn't apply, but those are going to be few and far between. So putting aside those incredible inventions, for most inventions out there, this will provide incentives to the innovator before the fact to not create as good an invention because they're not going to get paid as much. Right. But, uh, I'm sorry, we've got a microphone. So mm -hmm. the question is, at the SSO meetings, do you ever see among these thousand chefs, some of them try to take back some of their ingredients or not necessarily want their ingredients there? That's a question. <clears throat> oh, so... Um, so there's a couple of things you mentioned. So to answer your question, there might be only just like a hundred chefs, or you know, maybe not a thousand, but um, thousands of ingredients. So let's, but that's beside the point. Um, do I ever see them take back their innovations? No. So no. So what I think one of the fundamental concepts, and I hope I hope this came across, is that this is all consensus based, which consensus can mean different things. It's one of two things traditionally. It's lack of a sustained objection, or it's greater than a 75% approval. So if you are, if I'm company A and I submit something and I want my tech in, I got to get the approval of 75% of the entire organization of all the attendees. So it's not as easy as me inserting my tech. It's I'm, I'm, I'm making my suggestion of a really great technology to help improve you know, code access for some waveform, and because some smart PhD put it down on a piece of paper and has submitted it as an opportunity, and now I need 75% of the 100 attendees, aka 75 people at least, to agree that, yeah, that, you know, that is the great way to solve that problem. So it's not, um, it, it's not a, a matter of, uh, uh, of me putting it in and then and then pulling it back. I mean, I guess I don't know why you would pull it back. First of all, uh, because you know these guys are there. They're there to sort of uh, the whole concept of the rising rising tides. It, you, you're there. They're there. And it, I think I think Ted has a, has a really interesting um, uh, argument and, and theory, and, and I'd really like to read more about it. Um, so, and I disagree with a little bit of it because I do think that people are there for the best technology, uh, you know, and maybe I'm an altruist in that, in that regard. I've talked to other people, they're like, oh no, they're there for their self-interest. You know, I mean, no, they're there, they're engineers, this is what they've been doing for years, they're PhDs, they're they're, they love doing this, and they're there for the best technology. That's... You, you may not see people pulling back the ingredients, but what you do see on a non-infrequent basis is companies pulling back chefs, saying, okay, we're not gonna participate in this particular standard development effort because we think these are crown jewels or we think their IPR policy is too restrictive or for other business reasons. Yeah. So you don't ever let the engineers go and let them loose in those meetings because you know once you do, you've lost all control. And I think there's also, it's, it's <laughs> I don't, would you say by the best? Uh, it's engineering, so by definition, there are trade-offs. Uh, and what is an, a, a useful trade-off for one entity, one firm, is less beneficial to another firm. Uh, and therefore, it's political at the end of the day. 
So you know, the best is the, there's, the best is the, uh, the perfect is the enemy of the good, right? So it's typically the good uh, that wins, and you know, that's a political process. So there's there's these exogenous variables, and I think that's what Ted's really getting at in some sense is the exogenous variable here is the legal system, which itself has said these are the rules of the game when it comes to Fran. These are you know, and no injunctions, and because of that, that's now this external factor, and now the players can say, oh. Well, that's not, we have a new rule of the game, and so now we can. And now the game will be played in a different way. And if you have to change that rule of the game, if you change the rule of the game, you get a different outcome. And the rules of the game now lead to your conclusions. See, <laughs> and this is where I think just reality is a little different because these engineers, the word, the patent word never shows up in any discussions when you're sitting here in this room. They don't. I mean, they care about the technology. It's not that like some court out of the Ninth Circuit said that X, Y, Z is really what Fran means or whatever, they could care less. They're PhD double E's and they're there to invent the best technology to help meet the IMT 2020 goal. And so, and that's one of the things where I was trying to illustrate that I think we've sort of diverged on what the reality of how SDOs actually participate. And it's sort of like we've sort of fit a square peg into a round hole just because, you know, maybe it makes sense. But I don't know. It's, uh, I, th I certainly think Ted has some interesting um, so, points. So I'd agree they're going to pick the best technology that's there. My point is that the technologies that are there aren't going to be as good as they could be because of these external constraints imposed by courts. Because those technologies are only there because companies invest a lot of money in R&D and commercialization. So despite the engineers being incredible, they can only work right with the resources that are given. And what we've done now, because of friend obligations, not only injunctions, but also depressing monetary damages as well, is set up an incentive structure for companies now to invest less money because they're not getting paid as much as they otherwise would have without those obligations. Yeah, that's and, and to encourage you know, large influx by implementers who are, you know, they reform that large pool. And so the, the real innovators are kind of, now the market is, they have to come to market with it because there are so many implementers who other who otherwise have joined. So sure. it does create, I, th I think this is a very interesting insight that it creates an imbalance. Okay, I think we have a question over here. This is for Anne. Anne, you're, let me step back a second. NPEs and some of the ones you would label as privateers have really been shifting their practices, I'd say especially in the last three years. They're no longer taking assignments of patents. They know how unpopular they are. And they become litigation funding entities. So your data is stratified based on whether there's been an assignment to an NPE, or in particular, the group you're calling a privateer. I'm not sure how you're going to tease that out. I mean, uh, the other thing I wanted to say is those non-practicing entities are incredibly sophisticated. And a lot of the quality metric you seem to be seeing in the pool that's not part of the MPE may well be patents being litigated indirectly by some very, very sophisticated groups that are bankrolling it. Yeah. No, I agree with all your points. Um, I think this whole litigation funding thing has really blossomed over the last two, three, four years. Um, those are even harder to identify who's funding the uh, litigation. We're going with what we can tease out in the data, but I think it's still an exercise worth doing. I recognize that even within privateers, we're expecting to find heterogeneity, and that's part of our forward research plan, is to figure out what do these guys look like and how do they differ from one another, let alone how do they differ from other PAEs, from practicing entities, et cetera. Um, I'm not sure how to address the funding question just because I, from a data perspective, I don't know how to get at it, but I agree with you that that has been a, a huge trend in all of patent litigation for practicing entities and non-practicing entities, um, is, is shifting some of that risk um, onto the funder and with, with contingent contracts. Um, but you know, until you point out a data set for me, I'm not sure how I'll, how I'll research that one. <laughs> So I have a question for you. Okay. Um, to what extent are you, a lot of your, num, your analysis, or some of your analysis is based on metrics like the length of the claim, forward citations. Right. Um, 
to what extent do you adjust or normalize for variations between different types of technologies? Oh, because we're controlling for technology class in all of these. And that's the NBER, Hall et al, um, technology grouping. So we're taking the USPTO's tech classes and shuttling them into applied technology groupings. Right, but then do you yeah. say, do you get an average claim length for that yes. technology grouping? Yes. Okay, yes. and an average number or distribution of forward citations for that technology group. Right, because the point of this okay. is to use things that are objective, that can be replicated, that you can point to and say, okay, if I, suppose I'm a hybrid PAE and I'm on the market for a new patent. I may not be able to afford a Bob Sachs to go through and do all the formulas and figure out, is this a high quality patent? I want to do a quick and dirty. I'm evaluating an entire portfolio. What are the objective measures that I can look at? And also from you know an, an economist, I want something that doesn't re require my subjective take on are right. these good or bad patents. Um, I want so something. E that even after adjusting, that's, that's I'm glad you heard you're adjusting for technology. Oh, absolutely. But yeah. even after that, um, I'm a little bit suspect of the claim length as a proxy for anything. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, why um, why would it be to, uh, so statistically significant in results? It's capturing something. What do you think it's capturing? Like our best guess was that it was capturing scope. If it's not capturing scope, I'd love to hear you know what you think it is. I, I'm not sure I know, but I know as a drafter, mm -hmm. um, I can describe you know a pen very narrowly with a very short number of words, and I can describe it very broadly with a large number of words. But why would you? Um, exactly. Well, for one thing, exactly to play the game. Right, uh, I could you know, that that I have a long claim makes it hard to figure out exactly. You know, not that I do this, but I could see someone. <laughs> <laughs> I don't sure. do this. I don't do this. I actually, I actually, because I believe in precision. Um, <laughs> but that said, uh, I can imagine lots of things. Um, but it, for someone who wants to, like, they have that, you know, the the nose of wax deal. Mm -hmm. You can do that. Uh, by the words you choose and the manipulation. But if that so it's the were semantics, the case, not, not across syntactic. a large number of patents, we would get no statistical significance because length wouldn't be telling us anything. Some would be short when they're really not broad, they're narrow. Some would be long when they're really. So, what, what do you think it's. I don't what? know. I, that's, I'm not, you're the patent <laughs> expert. I'm just an economist. Come on. <laughs> and, and you think it's significant because it's what, what it is the, statistically I, significant in regression analysis. So we're doing logit models. We're controlling for lots of stuff, and we are getting consistently statistically significant results for the length of the the shortest claim in a given patent. Mm -hmm. That's capturing something. Right? My guess is that it's breadth, but if it's not, if a patent expert has another theory, by all means, let me know what it is. Let me, let me think about it. <laughs> okay, you tell me later. Okay. Uh, we have another question out in the audience. I have a bit of a question and a comment for Professor Sickleman. Um, I'm a longstanding IEEE member, and I'm sitting with several members. And about six years ago, I chaired a public policy committee, an IP committee, for one of their operating units. And with one of the speakers that you have uh, tomorrow, Dr. Ron Katznelson, uh, three of us made a presentation to the IEEE USA and IEEE boards in New Jersey when they moved um, their uh, royalty rate to small assailable component. And as a private practicing patent lawyer, and as most of the committee members on my committee saw, essentially, there's very little reason to develop technology and contribute it to an organization that's no longer going to pay for people that are contributing technology. Certainly, they can't even afford to pay patent lawyers to look at intellectual property. So I can tell you in the last five years since that, we, we were successful in convincing one board to withdraw delegated authority to standards. And we were able to convince, and I was on that board, um, and we were able to convince IEEE to withdraw the delegated authority. But come January 1st, they promulgated a new board and they changed the policy back. And one of my colleagues, uh, who was at Los Alamos Labs, whose father was a CEO of a tech company, who also made the presentation with us, told me privately, he said, look, uh, my father got it right away. This falls into the hands of Huawei. And what happens is IEEE standards will not attract technology anymore. As a private practicing lawyer, I can tell you, I have kept every one of my clients away from ever contributing to an IEEE standard, and I've been a, I'm a senior member and I've been a member for years. 
So it's fatalistic, and I think in over a 20-year period, IEEE standards just goes away. And so I think it's very selfish for the implementers to think that they are going to be able to acquire startups in China because there won't be any startups left here in the U.S. I'm advising people not to do these things. I mean, given other choices, we make choices that are smart. We don't, we don't burn our fingers on hot coals. Well, that's great to hear that there are other choices. Um, but I think that for certain standards, there aren't other choices, unfortunately, right? So if you're an innovator, you're forced to join. So the wireless industry is a good example of that. So if there are other choices, um, then you have more of a competitive landscape on both sides for innovators and implementers. But when there are not, this is a situation, I believe, where courts need to step in and be active and or right, the government, instead of the FTC fighting innovators, maybe they need to look into the anti-competitive practices going on at the IEEE because it's not just a hold-up problem. There's an additional hold-out, what I call hold-down, massively depressing the incentives for innovators, as you said. So that's very useful to hear, and perhaps we can talk afterwards. Can, can I comment? So I feel like I agree with Ted, but then I feel like I don't agree with Ted. So <laughs> I'm having a holdover. <laughs> um, so, so some of the interesting things that are, that are out there right now, I mean, IEEE is an interesting situation. Um, and, uh, uh, but I still sort of, I still, so, you know, you mentioned the anti-competitive effects or the, of the, um, maybe the conduct actually of having sort of one selection or one standards body for cellular, for example. Well, you need that. You need to have one standard. Otherwise, you know, it has to be global. It ha you know, you, you, you sort of, it's sort of by design. Otherwise, if you don't, then then the technology that works in the, like just remember GSM and CDMA, that was 2G and then they worked on 3G at UMTS and LT. And you, so you'd go to Europe and your phone wouldn't work in Europe and so you'd need to bring a European phone and vice versa, but now I can bring my AT&T phone and it works just fine because it's all LTE. I think that yes, you can have these competitive technologies, but at the end of the day, if you want a global marketplace, like we saw on one of my slides, if you want to have something that interoperates and you want to have an enabling technology for everybody, not just, you know, let's leave, you know, some country behind or some region behind because, you know, or that that's not where it was developed or because or for whatever reason, you still need that that constant a single standard because it's called a standard. Can I ask you a follow-on question? So with um, I You, me or him? You, you, me, Jim. 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 Okay. Jim. <laughs> Um, so with IoT and 5G, I mean, I agree with you that the, the whole purpose of standard setting, standard development is to jettison options so that you are left with the narrower set so that you can all coordinate on those and that improves consumer welfare over the long run. My question is about the sequential nature of standard development, though. And wouldn't the point about the options, it's not just, okay, yes, I may need to join IEEE today for the current 802.11 standard, but what about tomorrow's iteration, the you know, 5G? Can't, can't these processes shift over SDOs, or is that just too, I mean, is that just too hard? Uh, can you repeat? <laughs> <laughs> I don't... So, so, so well, for example, like like IEEE, they do have a wireless standard that, I, that uh, at least in the vehicle space, is meant to compete with V2X, which is in the cellular space. The, 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 the IEEE version is 802.11p, which is, has this other nomenclature of G5 or something like that. So there, there is some healthy competition right now going on between uh, like vehicular IoT sort of work, um, but I totally don't know what question you were asking, but I would just mention that as a statement. <laughs> okay, give up. Let's talk out. Let's talk offline. Okay. Are there other questions out there? I have a Get somebody back there. Yeah. Hello. Uh, thank you for a great discussion. This is kind of a more general first observation um, that the tactical advantages, especially if we're talking on standards and that type of thing, is more of what you discussed. 
There are other issues beyond the tactical advantages, uh, strategic, um, which is again, we sort of alluded to in sort of the other advantages that can't be monetarized or at least measured in monetary measure in social benefits on standards. And that is a very difficult question and very worthy of a discussion in academic institutions such as this. But more specifically, um, when there are issues of, uh, of disruptive innovation, where disruptive innovation is necessary, meaning that the, either the technology or the uh, commercial environment is not satisfying some sort of market need or a technological or environmental um, necessity, and there is a need for a disruptive type of jump from existing standards or existing standards bodies. How, how would you suggest that should best be done that, that is um, compatible with your, your system? So for me? <laughs> so, uh, so, so I think, as I said, if, if disruptive technologies, great technologies, they're going to be adopted regardless of the SSO. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there's this middle world between sort of small incremental changes to right, a standard that's been cemented, especially uh, by sequential development, where you have the same companies, the same people, the same base you're building on top of, and those amazing technologies that everyone's going to adopt. And my view is the way to do that is to pay the amounts of money we need to get those types of technologies just like we do with patents that aren't encumbered by FRAND. And what I'm showing you is, is that private parties will have an incentive to agree to FRAND when it's not necessarily in the best interest of society. How do you do that? You have to get courts and the government to measure these costs and of course balance them against the benefits of having right, a single standard setting organization in a given area the benefits from solving potential holdup problems, though those don't seem to be as great as we may have once thought, and weigh this out. But when we have one-sided approaches to these problems, particularly one-sided approaches pushed by implementers, you're not going to get the ideal outcome. The devil is in the details, of course, on how to do that, but we need to get a good broad macro understanding of how this all works before we dive into those details. So I know we have a few minutes left, but I wanted to agree with him on, on, um, on, the, on exactly what he just sort of talked about. Um, one of the things I did want to mention was uh, Anne, I think in one of her slides, had mentioned that uh, privateers take longer to litigate after a grant. And having known people that buried the bodies in this industry, um, one of the reasons for this and the work of a privateer is that, you know, they'll get these patents assigned to them from an operating company traditionally, and the operating company's like, well, you know, we want to be white, height, white hat license, licensees or licensors, do a soft licensing campaign, and that's like sending letters and going to meetings and talk to somebody for like years compared to going out and litigating and getting an answer right away. Um, so that's, I think, answers one of the reasons why it takes a long time for privateers to initially litigate because they sort of get these patents as, uh, uh, from, from an operating company that wants to be a white hat licensing organization because they know the um, assignment data and the PTO will, will reflect that. Um, so yeah. Time one more? Okay. Okay, so I think it was uh, Mr. Sachs mentioned that uh, pools can have uh, substitute technology. So if I understand it correctly. They're, they're not supposed to have substitutes, they're supposed mm -hmm. to have complements. Okay, only complement. But you had mentioned, in fact, in one of in the fact, examples. They don't. It's that not, they it's not a clear distinction. Okay, but you had, there was one of your examples that had, uh, you said there were three substitutes. So is that something that you can have if you justify it, for example? You say, well, they're all equivalent, or we can't pick a better one, or, or that was just not supposed to be there. Um, Didn't you have a slide that had, you said yeah, these yeah, yeah. three so, are. So, yeah, okay. in AAC, in, in, there are three possible ways to encode, the, to do the final encoding of the bitstream. It turns out that two of them are, are actually just not even used. They're in the standard, 
but the what's called AAC, and which is what everybody uses in their phone, that is what is used. There are there's uh, one called BSAC and one called TwinVQ. They're in the standard. They're there, but in real life they don't get they don't they simply don't happen. Um, I don't know how it is they ended up in the standard. I wasn't there, but my point is that the 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 notion from the DOJ that standards only include complements, they do not include substitutes, is not a, is not actually accurate. In real life, there are lots the, the patents don't fall. You can't neatly divide any given patent as to oh that's a substitute, that's a complement. It it very much is the distinction is not real at least well, from a patent perspective. It's not as stark as the DOJ would have it, but in defense of the DOJ, I think what they have in mind is that if it's not something that's captured in the standard, it's not in any of the specifications, but there are alternative ways to comply with standards because standards are compliance with a standard is measured by the output of the product or service, not by its input, not by its code, not by the guts. It's by do you meet these does your product meet these specs? And there are ways, occasionally, to meet those specs by doing an end run around what's actually on the standard specifications. And what the DOJ wants to prevent is the cutting off of those routes, right? But if it's an option in the standard, it should be included in a patent pool because it's covered in the standard, and as an implementer, I want to be able to choose from all of those. It's it's not causing any consumer harm in no, other no, words. Yeah, there's that's what their that's what their okay. ultimate goal that's, is. is that the may be true, but again, it, it doesn't really map to what's to what's on the ground. In other words, there's lots of patents in this it, that that are essential that cover very narrow slices. There are there are three paths through the code, right? right? The, the the product has to do A, B, or C. One path. These are are these substitutes for each other? Are they complements? They're they're really neither. They're kind of both. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, and there's lots and most of the patents are that. It's, you know, substitutes are the gas stove versus the electric stove. Those are substitutes. But most of what are in patents or in standards are much lower level, and they're yeah. neither substitutes or complements. They're, they're bits and pieces of things. So that, that's what I'm saying. The, it, it's just not the case that, you know, as the DOJ says, you know, the independent evaluator is the safeguard against the you know, well, of substitutes. You still the are the safeguard, but it's it's a it's a higher level safeguard for preventing this consumer harm of closing off alternatives to. I, I do not have the it. DOJ angel sitting on my shoulder. Going, oh, that looks like a substitute. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> don't it. Uh, no, no, it is a substitute. No, 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 uh, with that, with, with that fantastic uh, <laughs> imagery in our head. Um, I, it, Kevin is giving me the out of time signal. So please let's thank our panelists one more time. This was great. Thank you. Thank you.